Welcome to the Pathfinder Spellbook. Howdy, my name is Nonat, and here on the Pathfinder Spellbook, we discuss every single spell in the game alphabetically from level to level, giving my thoughts, opinions, and descriptions on how they work. In the last episode, the first inaugural episode, we talked about half of the cantrips in the game, and now we're going to talk about the other half. Before we get started, I just want to thank today's sponsor, Moonlight Maps, once again for sponsoring the channel. Be sure to check out some of their amazing maps like their city, tavern, or their catacombs. They have those and so many more really cool maps available on their website, linked in the description. I'd also like to thank all of my patrons for supporting me financially, and I hope all of you are enjoying the first official No Nat Ones Monster Month TM. If you're not aware, I'll be releasing 20 unique homebrewed kobold monsters all throughout the month of August, available to any Patreon tier from $5 and higher. So if that interests you and you want some cool homebrewed monsters, check out the link in the description or the pinned comment below to go to the No Not Ones Patreon page and pledge today to get access to no less than three kobolds already released with 17 more to come. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate all of you and everything you do, even if you just like the video. I thank you humbly. Now let's talk about spells. Now I'm going to warn you, we're starting with a complicated one. Light. It makes light. Okay, let's go. Let's go a little more in depth. Every single spellcaster in the game can learn this cantrip, and for two actions, you touch one object of one bulk or less, and that object shines with light that extends up to 30 feet. I lied, it's 20 feet. It basically functions the exact same way as a torch. 20 feet of bright light, 20 feet of dim light, and then it doesn't go any farther. What's nice is it doesn't take any kind of concentration or sustaining. It will last until your next daily preparations or you dismiss the spell, but keep in mind you can only have one item affected at any given time. No matter what level spellcaster, even if you're a 20th level arc wizard, if you enchant this mug to shine with light, you cannot also enchant this Dunkaroos wrapper. I'm an adult. Also, once you reach character level 7 and cast this at 4th level, it is a 60 foot bright light and then 60 foot dim light radius, which is really nice. I hope you can choose. It doesn't say you can, but I think you can downcast a cantrip? I'm not sure. If you are level 7 and cantrips are cast at 4th level, can you no longer create a dimmer light cantrip? Let me know in the comments. I don't know that inter interaction. Was I rating these in the last one? I think I was. I'm not gonna anymore. That was stupid. A fan favorite, Mage Hand, two actions for arcane and occult casters. You conjure a little invisible force that functions like a hand, and it can target any unattended object of light, bulk, or less. So basically a potion, a coin, anything that doesn't really have any real weight to it. That object moves up to 20 feet in any direction, and you can resustain the spell to move it another 20 feet. The Mage Hand can never move more than 30 feet away from you, otherwise it will dispel immediately and drop the item it is holding. But keep in mind, it takes one action to sustain a spell. So when you cast Mage Hand, say you do it in combat for some reason, you can move something 20 feet when you cast it, and then using your third action, you can sustain the Mage Hand to move it an additional 20 feet. So for three actions, you can move something 40 feet, which is not bad. And at level three, or I should say character level five, you can use this on any unattended item of one bulk or less. That is most weapons, especially most single-handed weapons. So if somebody disarms a longsword out of an enemy's grip, you can mage hand that longsword 40 feet towards you. At spell level 5, the range increases to 60 feet, and at spell level 7, you can use Mage Hand on objects of bulk 2 or less. Correct me if I'm wrong, isn't plate armor bulk- <laughs> No, plate armor is bulk 4. I don't know bulk that well, but I'm pretty sure there's no weapon in the game that is higher than bulk 2. So at le character level 13, you can Mage Hand a Warhammer or a Greatsword once it's been disarmed, which is just so cool. Message might be my single favorite cantrip of any cantrip in any system, which is great because message is pretty much in every single system. Available to all casters except Primal, this is a single action verbal component spell with a range of 120 feet. You can target any creature and telepathically communicate to them with a message. 
What is interesting is this does have a verbal component, meaning you do need to make some kind of sound when you cast message. But in every game I've ever played, whether as a player or as a GM, message has always been able to be cast very subtly, very quietly, and unless you're doing something to draw attention to yourself, most people won't notice it. So in the heat of combat, casting message to quietly give a message to your fighter to run away so you can fireball without alerting the six goblins next to them can be incredibly helpful. And once you are character level five and heightened this to third level, it has a 500 foot range. This is good in combat. This is good in role play. This is good to share secrets from your other party members, which I don't advise, but sometimes you need to. There, I love this spell. What I don't like all that much is prestidigitation. Yeah, 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 you can yell at me for that one. Any spellcaster can learn prestidigitation. It costs two actions with a range of 10 feet to do something to something. I'm just gonna read this off because I can't remember all of these, which is part of why I don't use prestidigitation. You can cool, warm, or flavor a pound of non-living material. You can slowly lift a light bulk object one foot off the ground. You can make a temporary object, but it has to be useless. It cannot have any use. It cannot be a tool or a weapon. It has to look crude. It always looks fake. I have never seen someone use this. Maybe once. The most useful thing press digitation can do is tidy, color, clean, or soil an object of light, bulk, or less or if you spend a full minute doing so, it can be up to one bulk. This is useful if you just fell in the mud and just wanna get the mud off of you, but I never use press digitation and I only see people use it to like make their beer look green or to clean their clothes off after falling in the mud. That's not a bad thing. I don't get mad at people for using it, but I personally, I don't know. There's something about prestidigitation that just doesn't hit home for me and I can't put it into words. I don't dislike people for liking it, but I don't like it. On top of that, what a lot of people don't realize is what you are doing only lasts as long as you sustain the spell. So if you warm something or flavor it to taste like Diet Coke, well, it's only gonna taste like Diet Coke until you cancel the spell. Or if you're warming it up because you want your grilled cheese sandwich to be warm again because you left it outside instead of putting it in the microwave to heat it back up, you can heat it up and then if you don't sustain the smell, it's gonna get cold again and that's gonna be gross. No one wants a cold grilled cheese. That's just cheese. Produce Flame, we are back to the offensive spells and personally, this might be my favorite. I am a sucker for persistent damage, but Produce Flame is available to arcane and primal casters with a range of 30 feet. It is a two action spell attack Pretty simple stuff. If you hit, you deal 1d4 plus spell mod fire damage. If you critically hit, you deal 2d4 plus double spell mod plus 1d4 persistent fire damage. Very, very nice. It's even better once it starts getting heightened. Once it's cast at second level, it's dealing 2d4 and on a crit, 2d4 persistent fire damage. That is some amazing scaling fire damage. I had this on my Eldritch Archer Fighter where critical hits are not uncommon. So lighting things on fire with Produce Flame was fantastic damage. Persistent damage is so fun and reliable. Also, the most confusing line about Produce Flame is that you can make a melee attack against a creature in your unarmed reach. It is not clear here that that is a melee spell attack. You can't, like, cast Produce Flame, but roll your melee weapon strike. So it doesn't quite work that way, otherwise it would be super busted for every fighter in the game to take that archetype for wizard or something like that. It does need to be a melee spell attack. A close second for my favorite offensive cantrip is definitely Ray of Frost. It doesn't do the most damage, it doesn't have the most useful effect, but what it does have is a 120 foot range. That is quadruple most other offensive cantrips. Produce Flame, Tangle Foot, Electric Arc, they all have a 30 foot range. This is quadruple that. It is available to Arcane and Primal Casters for two actions, you make an attack roll, a spell attack roll, against any creature within 120 feet to deal 1d4 plus spell mod damage. If you critically hit, you double your damage and they are slowed by 10 feet for one round. 
This is great. The damage goes up by 1d4 whenever it's heightened, and while you do miss that persistent fire damage from Produce Flame, and you miss the multi-target damage of Electric Arc, don't forget that that 10-foot status penalty to speed can help a lot, and having that kind of range is incredible. I love Ray of Frost, and I take it on almost all of my casters. Read Aura is really confusing for new players, so let me explain it. Any spellcaster can take this, and for one minute, it takes a full minute to cast this spell, you get to learn if an object is magical and what school that magic is from. Compare this to a first level detect magic, which just tells you, is there magic nearby? A very common thing to do is to cast detect magic, use it to narrow down what is magical, and then read the aura of that magical item to learn what it does. Read Aura becomes far less useful at higher levels. Once it's spell level 3, you can read the aura of 10 things. Once it's spell level 6, you can read the aura of any number of things within 30 feet of you. The problem is that by that level, Detect Magic is already telling you what school the strongest source of magic is. Because of the way Detect Magic works, you learn of that magic so you can omit it from all future Detect Magic casts. So if there's 10 magical objects in front of you, you could read the aura of all of them for one minute, or casting Detect Magic, which I think is two actions. You can Detect Magic, find the strongest one and get that school, omit that from your Detect Magic, and Detect again, slowly omitting the next strongest and next strongest, and learning the, not only the school of each of them, but also the order of which they are the most powerful. So, read aura, somewhat redundant, I'm not going to lie. Probably the next most popular cantrip after Electric Arc, we have Shield, and it's not hard to see why. For a single action available to all casters except poor, poor Primal, Shield increases your AC by one. Simple as that. Until the start of your next turn, it acts as though you have raised a one AC shield in front of you, meaning even if you don't have the shield block feat, you can use the shield block reaction with this cantrip. That reduces the damage you take by five and instantly shatters your shield spell. The biggest drawback to this is that you cannot cast shield again for 10 minutes if your shield spell is shattered in this way. But it's still amazing damage reduction for spellcasters. Being able to reduce damage, especially at level one, reduce incoming damage by five, that's great. And this spell stays good. At character level five, you get to reduce damage by 10, and then 15 at character level nine, 20 at character level 13, and at character level 17, it maxes out at a 25 hardness shield. This does get slightly worse as 25 damage isn't over the top useful at level 17, but it's still better than nothing. Shield is amazing, and like old editions of both D&D and Pathfinder, it can be used to block Magic Missile, which I appreciate. Never get rid of that. I've never seen it come up once in my entire life, but someday it will, and I think it's a really cool interaction between spells, and I feel like more spells should interact with other spells. I like that. Sigil is another personal favorite spell of mine. It's simple, it's stupid, it almost has no impact on the game or the plot, but it's just fun to use. For two actions, you touch any object or creature and put your own personal spellcaster sigil onto them. This is a one square inch symbol of your own design. For example, my old elderly human wizard Ezekiel Pondwater the 16th had an E P W X V I. Ezekiel Pondwater the 16th. This mark lasts for one week or five minutes. If the creature scrubs and scrubs and scrubs, they can get rid of it. But as your spellcaster level goes up, say, casting at third level, it lasts for one month. Or at fifth level, it lasts for a year. Or at seventh level, only a character level 13, your sigil never fades unless it's washed off. And keep in mind, there's no rule against casting multiple sigils. If you just want to be a graffiti artist, you can just sigil, boop, sigil, boop, sigil, boop, sigil, boop, and just put your sigil everywhere around town. It's a great way to leave a calling card. It's a fun way to get into character and role play. You know, my, my fighter, who was also an oracle, had sigil, and typically when he would kill someone, he would leave his draconic mark 
on the body, you know, as a way of saying, yeah, I was the one who did this and I'm proud of it. It's a really cool way to just get some extra character flavor in there. I love this spell. Stabilize. Two actions, stabilize a target. If they currently have the dying condition, you remove it and set them to zero hit points. They do still gain the wounded condition, but this does prevent them from making saving throws. Also, it's not a touch spell. You can do this from 30 feet away. This is a good one to have on hand. It might not change the game, it might not save many lives, but having a divine or primal caster on hand who just has stabilize prepared can make a dire situation much safer. Summon instrument. Almost specifically for bards, this is available to occult and divine casters. For three actions, you conjure an instrument. You can summon any instrument, which I love, and you have it for one hour. This means you are always prepared to play something somewhere for someone. You can never have more than one instrument summoned this way as it replaces the old one. And once you are character level 9 and casting this at 5th level, it's a virtuoso instrument, which means while playing it, you get a plus 1 to performance. That ain't bad, I'm not gonna lie. Tanglefoot, another spell that is not used super often, and it's unfortunately easy to see why. Tanglefoot, especially compared to some of the damage dealing cantrips, is not that powerful. Two actions available to Arcane and Primal, you make a spell attack roll, weirdly enough, not a saving throw, to sprout vines around and entangle the legs of your target. If you succeed, you give them a 10 foot speed penalty for one round. They also can just escape to get rid of it. Now the critical success is really good. It gives the immobilized condition so they have to escape from it in order to even move that round. But it's still only on a critical success that anything of real note happens with this spell. Immobilized is great, but a 10 foot speed penalty with nothing else around it isn't that great. This does get better at higher levels. At character level 3, it does last for 2 rounds instead of 1, which can be great if something is trying to flee. And at character level 7, inflicting a 10 foot speed penalty for 1 minute is really solid. It's just below level 7, Tanglefoot is hard to recommend over something like Ray of Frost. And finally, the last cantrip. The most simple offensive cantrip and some people's personal favorite, Telekinetic Projectile. Available to Arcane and Occult Casters for two actions, you make a spell attack roll against a target's armor class. Should you succeed, you pick up a loose piece of debris or a twig or a broken piece of anything and fling it at a target within 30 feet of you. It hits and deals 1d6 plus spellcasting modifier and damage, and if you critically hit, it deals double. No extra effect, no penalties, no bonuses. This is just damage. You don't have to target multiple things. There's no persistent damage. There's no movement speed penalty. It is just flat damage, and it is the highest single target damaging cantrip available. 1d6 plus spell mod. If that doubles, that can really chunk at level 1. I have no complaints about this spell. I think it is perfect. I think it is nice. I kind of wish it was available to all spellcasters, or if at least Divine and Primal got something similar that's just reliable and simple like this, but overall, it makes sense that it's Arcane and Occult, and I really, really do enjoy it. And that's it! Every single cantrip in Pathfinder 2e reviewed, discussed, and opinionized. What did you guys think? Do you have a favorite cantrip? Do you have a least favorite? Do you agree with me? Do you disagree? Let me know in the comments. I want to hear about you, your personal spells, some crazy stories you have with some of those spells. Let me know down in the comments. If you did enjoy this video, I really do appreciate it if you take the time to scroll down and like it. It's completely free. It doesn't hurt you in any way. I kind of burped a little bit, but I'm going to keep going with this take. The more likes a video gets, the more likely YouTube's going to be like, oh, well, um, I guess we'll show more people. So thank you so much for liking the video, and if you do want to stick around and see more Pathfinder 2e content just like this, be sure to subscribe to the channel. It helps me out immensely. Thank you all so very much for watching. Thank you to Moonlight Maps for supporting this video. Be sure to check out the link in the description to go to Moonlight Maps and purchase some awesome battle maps. So thank you all so very much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and until next time, no nat ones.